around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Good evening, friends. David Langford here today, and we'd like to welcome each of you to this edition of The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Today is Tuesday. I welcome you today. I bless you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who died on an old rugged cross to redeem us from our sins, wash us, cleanse us, forgive us, and restore us into a right and proper relationship with God the Father through the efficacious sacrifice, the desired effect, efficacious. You hear that in the medical field, the efficacy. What's the desired effect? That was to redeem us, bring us back to the Father through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We addressed Israel yesterday, the nation of Israel. We're going to pick that back up today in Genesis chapter 15. And I want to reiterate today what I said yesterday. Again, this is a rhetorical statement or question. I'm not directing it at anyone particular. It's just a rhetorical statement. Why do you have hatred in your heart toward Israel? What have they ever done to you? What have they ever done to your family? Why is that feeling there? It's because you don't know the truth. I learned years ago about people and the power of the tongue. What do I mean by that? There there have been times in your life you hurt something about someone, you did not know them, you only knew of them, and their name came up in a conversation with someone that you knew that also knew them, but that person that you're talking to concerning the other party begins to castigate, malign, assassinate, eviscerate, you name it, they're talking evil about the person. You really don't know the person they're talking about, but you know of them. But one day, all of a sudden, you have the opportunity to meet that person. You're skeptical. Sadly, you already have a preconceived idea, and you also have a preconceived idea as to how you're going to treat them. But as you begin to talk to them, they're not what the other person said they were. Then as you understand them and know them more, you begin to realize the person who castigated them is the real culprit, the real liar, the real deceiver, the real manipulator. That's the power of the tongue. I've had that happen to me several times where admittedly I had a preconceived idea of someone I really didn't know. Then when I came to know them, I realized the person that's bad-mouthing them is the true evil one. I've learned to accept that. There are people who castigate me, lie on me. They're the liar. They're the cheater. They're the deceiver. They're the manipulator. They're the dishonest one. They're the one that'll cheat, curse, swear, you name it. They do it but then they'll castigate me. But that's all right, because I know the life that I live. I know the life that others live because I've been around them. And believe you me, you can try to help people. You can try to steer them in a better path of righteousness. And they say all the right things, but at the end of the day, they're corrupt. They're immoral. They're deficient, profusely deficient in righteousness. That's why Paul said, know them that labor among you. 
I could sit here today and talk about a lot of people, but I won't waste my time and I won't sow discord. I just don't have anything to do with them. That always ought to be an indicator when you see someone's life who is consistent over and over and over and over again, they're consistent in, in righteousness. And then someone comes along and tries to assassinate them. You need to realize who's telling the truth. Here's what I have witnessed. Here's what I have observed for 35, 40, 50 years. But now all of a sudden this one person comes along and says this about them. I had someone who done me like that one time and the, the person they were talking to didn't know how well they knew me. And then when the person got through assassinating me, the other person said, that's not the pastor I attend the church of. They didn't know the guy went to my church. He said, you're talking about somebody else because I know my pastor, that's not who he is. And then the person turned beat red because they realized they had lied and lied and lied. The world is full of liars. I want to go back today. I want to begin in Genesis chapter 15. I want to show you a more thorough portion of the Abrahamic covenant that God made with Abraham. Let's get into this very quickly today. Genesis chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shalt not be thine heir. Ishmael, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom thou shalt serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And that shalt go to thy fathers in peace, that shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, that means the Nile, Unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenanites, and the Kenazites, and the Kadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Pezerites, 
and the Rephims, or the giants, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. This was when God gave more thorough definition, interpretation, explanation of the covenant that he would make with Abraham, better known as the Abrahamic covenant. I want to say, first of all, this was all based on God's part. I know Abraham brought these things to him relative to sacrifice. We'll, we'll look at those in just a moment. But Abraham, as a man, brought nothing to the covenant. You see, God gives the turtle dove, the pigeon, the goat, the ram, the heifer. That's, that's the fruit of God's creation. Abraham brought himself. When you come to God, you don't bring anything with you but just who you are and what you are. God has a relationship with you based on his love for you. When Gabriel came to Mary, he said, Thou art highly favored and blessed among women. That word blessed in the Greek means, though the Greek word is eulogia, we use the word eulogy relative to a decedent. We eulogize a person when they pass away. But when Gabriel is talking to Mary, what that means in the Greek is this. Mary, God is bringing you into a divine relationship with him wherein you bring nothing to the table. This is a sovereign act of God. This is a choice by God himself. And he chose you to be the instrument wherein Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would be born and come through your vessel. He would come through your, 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 your femininity. He, he would come through your female life, organs, etc. But this conception will be through the Holy Ghost. This is something beyond our ability to understand and conception. It wasn't a conception in the natural that you and I are familiar with, know, realize, and understand. Uh, my wife and I, we have conceived five times. We have four children. She miscarried once. That's, that's a human conception, coitus. It's an act. But my point is, that's not what happened to Mary. Th th there, there was an infusion of the Holy Ghost of God in her body, and God brought her into a relationship with him wherein she had no part. She didn't merit. She didn't earn. It was just a divine choice of God. So it was with Abraham. He didn't earn. He didn't merit. There's no indication he had any element of righteousness in him whatsoever, being the son of a pagan. But God made a divine choice. God made a divine election. And here's where we see the first act of faith in the sense of the new covenant, or would be in the end a new covenant. It was before the Mosaic law. And that's when we read here in Genesis 15 and 6, and he, Abraham, believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. You might say this is when Abraham became born again. It was an act of faith. It was a choice of God. You, you and I could not be saved except God first commended his love toward us and we became born again. Romans 5 and 8, or 5 and 5. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commended his love toward you and I. We weren't worthy to be saved. We weren't fit to be saved, but God did that because he commended his love toward us. So Abraham 
came into this relationship with Jehovah based on his faith. You might say justification by faith, justified, made blameless, made holy, made spotless because he put his faith in what God said he was going to do. All right, we see here in Genesis 15 how God begins to establish this august covenant that he's going to make with Abraham. But the apostle Paul gives us insight in Romans chapter 4 regarding this Abrahamic covenant. I want to go now to Romans chapter 4. I want to help try to put some things together here to help you to understand the Mosaic law was always temporary. It never satisfied God's demand. So the law is bookended by grace. Grace in the days of Noah received grace in the eyes of God. Abraham received grace in the eyes of God. We come into the New Testament dispensation. It's all by grace. So the 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 Mosaic law and all the ordinances are bookended by grace. So let's look at Romans chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him, that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. I know that's a whole lot. I want to take the time to look at that today through the NLT. Then we'll go back and we'll do a little exegesis here concerning Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Let me get there right quickly. This is from the NLT. Romans 4, verses 1 through 6. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. Did you get that? The founder of our Jewish nation. That's why I wanted to read that, because Paul talks about him as pertaining to the flesh in Romans 4 and 1. In the King James, the NLT made it just a little bit more simple. He is the founding father of the Jewish nation. What were his experiences concerning this question of being saved by faith? Was it because of his good deeds that God accepted him? If so, he would have had something to boast about. But from God's point of view, Abraham had no basis at all for pride. For the scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God, so God declared him to be righteous. Again, why was he righteous? He believed in God. When people work, their wages are not a gift. Workers earn what they receive. But people are declared righteous because of their faith, not because of their work. King David spoke of this, describing the happiness of an undeserving sinner who is declared to be righteous. So let's look at that. Verse 1, Romans 4, 1. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, or the father of the Jewish nation, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? So the physical conception of Isaac Then, of course, Jacob, and then the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes, we have the birthing multiplied times 12 for this nation to quickly come into existence. Verse 2, 
For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. In other words, no one can glory before God because of their works. This is why I have fear for people who say, well, I did this and I did that. That's what saved me. Are you kidding me? You cannot remotely think you have something to do with your salvation. That, that, that puts you in a level contending, competing with deity. Oh, I, I did this. That's what saved me. Oh, my friend, how far are you skewed? God has never personally made a covenant with me, but he made one with Abraham and, and, and seven blessings in that covenant there in Genesis 12. Yet, he said, you don't have any reason to brag. Everything that I'm doing is on my part. You have no reason to glory, Abraham. Your works, man's works are so filthy. They're not even worthy to be compared to what Christ did on the cross. You know, I, I try to be a man of prayer, a man of the Bible, a, a man of fasting. I give. I, I try to do all the right things. I only do those things because I am saved. I never did any of that stuff before I came back to the Lord in 1978. But because I came back to the Lord, I have a relationship with him. I desire to do these things because I love him. I want to please my Lord. I want him to be pleased with me. I want to be pleasing in his sight. Everyone that has a genuine encounter with God wants to be pleasing to the Lord. Verse 3. This is the, this is the meat of Genesis 15 and 6. And here in Romans 4 and 3, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. The fact that one believes in the finished work of Christ and puts their faith in that finished work, that's what saves you. Nothing else in this world saves you. Genesis 15, 6, and he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he, God, counted it to him for righteousness. When you put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross, that's what saves you. That is the only thing that saves you. Nothing else saves you. You can do 10 Hail Marys, the rosary, you can give, you can have your body burned at the stake. That still does not save you. None of those things, that's religion. Think about the ability to sell indulgences. My God, is that corrupt or what? Think of that. Well, you know, I, 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 I want to commit adultery, so I'm going to run down here to the priest and I'm going I'm to buy me an indulgence. I, I don't know, I don't think they still do that, but they used to sell indulgences. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You can pay to commit adultery, you can pay to murder, you can pay to fornicate, whatever. See, that's religion. That old gospel song, Just As I Am Without One Plea. You, you come as you are. And, and, and your very best, Isaiah said, is as filthy rags. Filthy rags. Those are menstrual rags. That's what they are. That's what that means. I don't mean to be graphic and crude and plain, but I'm just trying to tell you that's, that's, that's what he says. I didn't say that. The Word of God said that. Verse 4 here in Romans now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. God owes no man anything because of his works. 
You know, and and I hope you understand when I reference or make a reference to the time I fasted 40 days. That didn't earn me nothing from God. Not one thing. I did that because I was in pursuit of God. I I was hungry for God. I was thirsty for God. But that didn't merit me anything. I know men that have fasted 40 days and told me, said, I, I, I fasted 40 days and didn't get a thing from God. I'm thinking, my, 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 I am so blessed. God chose to show me things. Again, I didn't say I'm going to fast 40 days. That was not my intent. My intent was to get to God and let him reveal some things to me that I feel like I I needed to know, that I must know. I'm telling you, you seek God. He'll get you on the straight and the narrow path, and he will keep you there if you truly love him. God owes no man anything, and when you bust your tail and you work so hard through prayer, fasting, giving, Bible memorization, whatever the case, that doesn't merit you anything. Well, I did this, and I did that, and I joined this church, and I kept this vow, and I kept That don't mean anything to God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When anyone works a job, their wages are not a gift. Their wages are what they rightfully earned. Did you hear that? When you work a job and on Friday you get your paycheck, that is not a gift. No, you gave them X amount of hours for X amount of dollars. You're swapping hours for dollars. It's called work on your part. It's called wages or rations on their part. That's not how this works with God. You can work all you want to work and try to get something from God. It won't get you anywhere with God because what God gives you has been bought and paid for by the blood of the lamb. Jesus paid the price, not you, not your works, not your deeds, You only have works. You only have Christian deeds because you are saved. God doesn't owe anyone anything because of their works. I love what David said. Oh, God, how thou art mindful of man. Who who are we men that you would be mindful of us? Oh, he created us. We know that. But to think he wants to be involved in your life, He wants to be involved in your marriage. He wants to be involved in your business. What is man that God would be mindful of us and take that type of interest in us? He does that solely because he loves us. Romans 4, verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth, the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Isn't that beautiful? But to him that does not work, to him that doesn't try to work and earn something, but simply believes on Jesus, that's what justifies the ungodly. His faith in what Jesus did is counted for righteousness. Man, I hope you can get this today. I know this may not make sense to you, but this is all about covenant with Abraham and what's taking place in the Middle East. (laughs) <laughs> they're still keeping the law. You know, I, 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 God knows my heart. They were, they were ladies. They were interviewing when this attack came on Israel on October the 7th. And I, they said, I only use my phone 
uh, because of an emergency. <laughs> is, that, is that legalistic or what? I only use my phone. Because, see, that's, that's, that's man-made tradition. That's, that's man trying to earn his work his way into salvation. This is why Jesus said, pray that your journey be not on the Sabbath. They won't travel more than a mile on the Sabbath. I know being over there, they, they, they cook a lot on Friday so they don't have to cook on Saturday. So you eat leftovers, warmovers, whatever the case. Jesus said in Matthew 24, pray that your journey be not in the winter. Pray that you're not with child with suck. Why? He knows how they will behave. He knows how they will act if the great tribulation begins on a Sabbath or they got children that, that they're nursing, et cetera, et cetera. God knows all of this. There's nothing he does not know, not one thing. He knows everything that will take place before it ever comes. He's the one that said, I know the end from the beginning. So Paul says here in verse 5, but to him that worketh not, to somebody who doesn't try to earn salvation, but believeth on him, that's what justifies them, or justifies, he says, the ungodly. His faith in the finished work of Christ, his faith in the cross of Calvary, that's accounted to him for righteousness. And then David said in verse 6 here, Romans 4, 6, even as David also describeth the blessedness of man, unto whom God imputeth or chargeth or gives you righteousness without works. You're granted righteousness without works. How was it, was it a year ago, year and a half, two years, I taught on justification by faith, Romans 5 and 1. You just believe and what Jesus did and that is what redeems you. If you think anything else in your life merits you redemption, salvation, and the forgiveness of sins apart from the cross, your faith is misplaced. And if you really believe that, you're deceived. Oh, I did this. That, that's why I'm saved. No, you're not. <laughs> no. 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 You're saved because you believe on what Jesus did. What Jesus did. Now, going back to Genesis 15, verse 9. And he, God, said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon... Now, that's almost crazy. This is what God asked. There's far more there in that passage than just these animals. A heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. What do we see there? We see the number five. Add them up. <clears throat> One and one and one and one and one. One heifer, one goat, one ram, one turtle dove, one young pigeon. Add that up, aggregate, you have the number five. In biblical numerology, <clears throat> five means grace. So what he's saying here is, Abraham, this act of God in your life is based on grace, nothing else. It saddens my heart to see the many people in Christianity that try to keep the law. As I said, I believe it was yesterday, grace was through Abraham. The law, Moses, came afterwards. So it's bookended. Grace before the law, grace 
after the law. If you're going to be saved, it is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Genesis 15, verse 13. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for hundred years. I'm not going to get into all the numbers. Somebody posted something on YouTube that they found an error in the Bible. I think they were trying to be sarcastic about the 430 years. You have to understand when God set the date, or again, this is about timing. It's just like in Daniel chapter 9, the 490 years. You have consecutively 483 years. We're waiting now for that last seven years, which that's what most people teach. I don't believe we're waiting for the last seven years. We're waiting for the last three and one half years. But again, it's about time. And you have to put together the right segments of time to come up with the 430 years that God said they would be in bondage. Verse 13 here speaks of Israel's future Egyptian bondage. Remember, this is Abram. This is not Isaac. This is not Jacob. The 12 sons have not been born. So the nation is still in its infancy. Early, 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 early on. But God prophesies they're going to go into affliction. They'll be strangers in a land that is not theirs. They'll serve them, the Egyptians, and they shall afflict them 400 years. When Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, and he brings the, all the sons and the family and Jacob back down to Egypt, they get the land of Goshen. That's what Pharaoh suggested they have, the land of Goshen. God was doing this to raise a nation. I love it. God made Pharaoh house, clothe, and feed a nation on their, on their dime, their expense. You, you got to remember something about God's plan. It is a process. It is so far-reaching and voluminous, it begs description. God's the one that created the famine. Joseph got to Egypt where God wanted him, and then God troubles Pharaoh with these dreams. And by the way, these are Jewish people. <laughs> God gives them, Pharaoh, these troubling dreams, but he gives Joseph the interpretation. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. It was the seven years and beginning of it, of the famine that brought Jacob's sons to Egypt to buy corn. This is all a process. This is God working all of this out for his glory, his honor, his praise. And you know the story. I don't have time to get into all of that. But in the end, Joseph sends all the wagons back to his dad. They pack up. Acts tells us there were 76 souls. They came back down to Goshen. And there they began to, to procreate and conceive. And they bear this nation while they were in captivity. God was making divine provision for them. Though they did not see that, though they did not understand that, God was making divine provision for them. Sometimes it's hard for us to understand where we are in God's timetable. We grapple. Genesis 15, verse 14, and also that nation whom they shall serve, talking about Egypt, will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. Look at that. God judged Egypt through the plagues. And the last plague was the death angel. But God made provision through the Passover Paschal Lamb. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This came through the Jewish people. 
Jesus said in John 4, 22, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship. Salvation is of the Jews. Anytime someone says to you and relative to castigating, encroaching, impinging Israel, remind them, hey, salvation is of the Jews. And then they're going to say, well, that's not the real Jews over there in the promised land, the holy land right now. Well, who is it? And if that's not them, where are they? Where are they? Where are those people that Ezekiel chapter 37 going to raise up all of these bones? Where are they? History. <laughs> As I said, the bow for agreement when Israel was given that rocky, worthless, desolate piece of land over there, and now they're fighting like crazy over it. Why didn't somebody want that? I mean, yes, the, 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 the Turkish Ottoman Empire had it. Britain had it. You read, you read the history. It, it's, it's really profound in all of these things. Let me go on. Verse 14, And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance, gold, silver, jewels, linen. They came out. That was reparations. You know, we got people in America who want reparations. They've never been in bondage. They've never been a slave. They've never served in any capacity, but they want reparations. Well, Israel did serve in bondage. They were whipped. They were beaten. They were treated with cruelty. God knew they would be treated cruelly because he knew that he said to Abraham, but listen, Abraham, I'm going to judge them. You'll be dead, you'll be gone, but I'm going to judge them because they will be harsh at times to my people. Why do you think God destroyed Babylon? Because Babylon had also been cruel to Israel and the captivity, the Babylonian captivity when they were exiled back to Babylon. You know, God will punish them, God will whip them, God will chasten them, but don't you do it. Don't you take the liberty? That's because he's God. Verse 15, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Abraham lived to be 175 years of age. You see, God knows everything. Verse 18, Genesis 15, 18, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, Here's the portion of land he gave them, saying unto thy seed, have I given this land from the river of Egypt, talking about the Nile, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. God circumcised a portion of land out for Abraham and said, Abraham, this is yours. By the way, God did not give Israel the whole world. He gave them a portion of land. See, God is just. I won't get into it, but in Acts chapter 17, you can see where God sets the boundaries. God predetermines where you're going to live. Did you know that? God predetermines where you're going to live, where I'm going to live. He sets the boundaries. That's the sovereignty of God. We have no idea how many predetermined decisions God has made for us. Acts 17, 26 and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. This is what you call predetermined. Predestination. And that's all I'll say about that. Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 9. Listen to this carefully. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham. Are they all children? Yes, but in Isaac 
shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. We all know the son would be Isaac. You have to understand Isaac was the promised seed, not Ishmael. Though Ishmael was the seed of Abraham, but he was not the promised seed. Let me share that here in the NLT, Romans 9, verses 6 through 9. Well then, has God failed to fulfill his promise to the Jews? No. For not everyone born into a Jewish family is truly a Jew. Now, who listening to me or not listening to me, you think you can make that determination? God can. Just the fact that they are descendants of Abraham doesn't make them truly Abraham's children. For the scriptures say, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Though Abraham had other children too. This means that Abram's physical descendants are not necessarily children of God. It is the children of the promise or the promised seed who are considered to be Abraham's children. For God had promised, next year I will return and Sarah will have a son. That was the promised seed. That was the seed that the Messiah would come through. What we have, we have Ishmaelites, that are of the seed of Abraham, but that is not the promised seed. Though they're in a, quote-unquote, Jewish family, they are not the true seed that God promised a man. Now, I find it amazing because after Sarah died, remember, the only true child that they had of the promise was Isaac. They had that one. Isaac and Ishmael were what? Half-brothers. Same father, different mothers. This is why we have the contention that also was there in Israel. But even after Sarah died, Abraham remarried. Abraham remarried, and he married a woman named Keturah. You'll find this in Genesis chapter 25. She bare Abraham, what was it, five or six more sons. She bare him six sons. They were the seed of Abraham, but they were not the promised seed. Now, all of Abraham's inheritance went to Isaac. Everything that he had went to Isaac. You'll find all this in Genesis chapter 25. None of the six sons from Keturah got anything. The Bible says it was all given to Isaac. Why? He was the promised son. He was the promised seed. Now, in closing today, I don't have time to finish all of this, but in closing today, the Bible prophesied these things were going to come to pass in the time of the end. This was going to be a, a, 
a point of contention and a point of friction. Genesis 16, verse 12. Let's let's do verse 11. Genesis 16, verses 11 and 12. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Hagar, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. She was only shown this favor because of Abraham. Remember that. She was only shown this extended favor and blessing because remember, that's part of the blessing in Genesis 12. That's why Hagar received the blessing. Now in Genesis 16, verse 12, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction and he... Ishmael will be a wild man. One interpretation says he'll be a wild ass. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Think about that. Half-brothers, Israel is surrounded by Muslim nations. Now think about this. Let's just say, you know, we all live in, I don't know, Tennessee. Every state around us hates us. Every border is contentious. Every border is dangerous. At every border, you could lose your life. At every border, you could be assassinated, murdered, beheaded, burned. How do you think you would feel knowing at every border, this is what I may face because of a wild man? Again, ask yourself this question. Why all the fuss, why all this unadulterated hatred for the Jewish people. Why? Well, I, I heard this, or yeah, that's not their land over there, bless God. That's, that's the Palestinians. Just go back and study your history. Go back and study your history. Go back 4,000 years ago. Study the Bible, the greatest history book in the world. Well, that's not the real Israel that's over there right now. I just read to you, they are not all Israel that call themselves Israel in Romans 9. What what about that do you not understand? I find it amazing how even so-called Christians get on the wrong side of this. Romans 9, verse 6, not all though the word of God hath taken none effect. What Paul is saying, let me paraphrase that. He's saying the word of God has not failed. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. God's word has not failed, he said. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. So all you geniuses out there who hate Israel You tell me who's the Israel of God and who's not the Israel of God. Even the Pharisees said, hey, we're Abraham's seed. All six of those sons that Keturah bear Abraham could say, I'm Abraham's seed too. All from Ishmael, I'm Abraham's seed too. Does that mean they are the Real Israel of God? See, God will sort all that out in judgment. You know, Paul and his barbarity, his brutality, his 
fierceness against the Jewish people himself, though he was a Jew, but it was over Christianity. Romans 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel as that they might be saved. You know, I've always prayed for Israel as a, as a Christian believer. Up till I quit pastoring in 2012, I took the last Wednesday night and every month at our church, and I took that service after all the preliminaries, etc. Instead of me preaching, I asked people to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You want to prosper? You want to be blessed? Pray for Israel. You want God's supernatural blessing on your life? See, some won't like this. Pray for Israel. Well, I, I don't like them people over there. Let me tell you something I learned about those people while I was there. Nobody that I'm aware of cares about life like the Israelis. Life, blessings, fruitfulness, enjoyment, those people strive for that. Think about this. They're the only nation over there that has nuclear weapons, and they've never used them. Do you think if anybody else over there had nuclear weapons, they would use it? Do you think they would use it? If Iran gets it, they'll use it. Israel has it, but they will not use it until they feel like they're going to be existentially destroyed. In other words, there'll be nothing left. An existential threat, meaning they'll just be wiped off the map. I'm praying, I pray you are. I believe the two aircraft carriers, Dwight, the Eisenhower, USS Gerald Ford, is there one or two ways to suffer Israel, to maybe to go take out Iran, and we cover Israel, meaning take care of Hamas, Hezbollah, whatever, keeps it held together, or we go take out Iran, and Israel fights Hamas and Hezbollah. Things are going to change. I don't mean to be pessimistic or close on a pessimistic note. But you shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. God bless you. Have a great week and work on your prayer life, I humbly pray. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.